We have almost an hour for discussion. Um, I wonder if I might just take um, my prerogative as moderator to uh, try to follow in your footsteps, Kelly, and just throw out a series of questions for each of the panelists to try to answer, um, to try to get at some of the issues you raised at the beginning of this session. Would that be all right? Okay, because, um, and then throw it open to, to questions from everybody. Um, but I thought what would be um, really interesting to hear from each of the panelists is, um, given that this is a panel about relationships, if you could talk about um, at least one way that you know that a relationship is successful and one way that you think would be useful to help build a relationship um, and any relationship. So maybe we can start at the end and go down. Unless somebody else wants to jump in. All right, having to go first here is <clears throat> tough. So relationships being successful. I think one of the things that's tricky in this relationship building is it often takes a while for the relationships to develop. And so any metric for success has to you know, be timed appropriately. So I'm, I'm not answering your question exactly. Um, I think for me, the primary way that we have determined whether our, our relationships were successful is whether we conducted research that the community felt was meaningful and important to them and then we're able to disseminate that research in a way that was accessible to the community and had direct, we could tie a direct implication to either changes in care or changes in policy. And that was all mediated through stakeholder relationships. Um, I'm gonna think a little bit more. I might be able to find, to come up with some more nuance there, but really that's kind of the gestalt of, of how we determine success in that relationship building. And of course, if people are willing to stay engaged, that always is a good sign of relationship building. And then you had a negative, a second part of that that you're gonna have to remind me of. Oh, I uh, if there was one way you could, um, something that you could name that you think would help uh, build or maintain a relationship? Right, I mean, so I think primarily for us, the ways that we've been most successful in retaining those relationships is make, making sure that it's a meaningful engagement so that people really do have some power and some control. Because the way I've seen it fail is when you invite people in and they have a very preliminary um, role very early and it's quite minimal and, and people are unwilling to really make serious change. And so I think that that is really the key in our engagement for success is that we truly are willing to change things very significantly, change our approaches, our methods, our priorities based on that engagement. Um, I think, you know, I mentioned before that we uh, have patients representing over 2,300 different conditions, but we probably excel in about 25 to 30 of them. And the reason for that is that in order to be successful uh, with building relationships is that you need to take the time to understand the condition, understand the trajectory of that condition, understand the kinds of questions you need to ask someone when they start uh, looking at the diagnostic process versus someone who's been living with that condition for many years. So it actually takes us about 12 months to, to decide that we're going to fully di deeply dive into a particular condition from the point of making that decision to the point of having what we believe is a successful relationship. And a lot of that is built upon ethnographic interviewing that's done with patients in the field via Skype, uh, with clinicians, with researchers, really trying to understand what are the uh, tensions and the problems that we actually on our platform could begin to address. So that's actually a big undertaking on our part and actually requires a lot of investment on our part. So we oftentimes are looking for collaborators to help support some of that work. Uh, we will never uh, get to all 2,300 conditions, uh, but we believe as we chip away and we deeply dive into these, we will begin to start to show, uh, create a framework within which others can start to think about using that as well. A few things that we've learned along the way, I think, that are just absolutely critical um, to success in any relationship, and that is, as, as I think we've already heard, um, engaging people in something meaningful. Uh, but really, and, and we heard this earlier as well, that research questions in and of themselves aren't necessarily the questions patients are asking. Um, so we need to be thinking about what are the kinds of things that matter to them that we can reframe into a research question um, and then find ways of being able to measure that and then learn from it and then collectively share that. So um, the other piece would be that we have learned uh, 
one key measure of engagement for our patients is, is um, making a commitment to them that if you give us something, we're going to give you something back. That can be as simple as telling us your age, and then we give you an infographic graphic that tells you all the other people within that community that have that same age or, you know, a comorbidity that you might have in conjunction with your primary condition and give you a, an instant infographic that shows you the other people like that. So I think it's an important piece that we have to keep remembering. And then finally, the dissemination of research results. We actually don't wait until the publication. We will share with those who participated in a survey the preliminary results so that they can get some insights right away from that. And then after that, the, the publication might come out and be more more specific about the details. So, so I think uh, there's, there's still a bit of an open question in what is uh, successful in uh, patient contact. Uh, Pecori had at one point a um, must measure um, enrollment or engagement, and everyone in the country scratched their heads on what that really meant in terms of is it for now, is it sustainable. So I think right now, um, you know, what I would see is being successful is from purely from a clinical research recruitment perspective is sustained retention and uh, over time. Um, you know, we, we've got lots of experiences of patients or participants who do maintain um, uh, participation in these research studies for no really good reason other than they're loyal. And we need to determine how that can be really more um, methodologized, made methodological, such that they, uh, we can understand how to retain, retain and, and in, ensure those relationships. I think it's very much echoing everything else here. Um, how we seek to do that, I think uh, th there's two parts of the of the CENA project that I think are trying to address that. One is that during the patient reported outcomes, which is where the participants uh, sign up and start define answering questions about the disease efficacy, we give them immediate feedback of how everyone else has answered those questions, like sub-second response time. If you've got this condition, if you've got that, we tell you how everyone else has answered it. So it's very engaging to learn dynamically while you're engaging how other thing else is doing. It's a very real-time, active, and actually fantastic um, in environment. But as part of that, we're also establishing conditions by which we can communicate with them to give them value, ultimately, um, over time. And uh, you know, how, how do they re best respond? Do they want to participate actively? Do they want to just get outcomes? Do they want to merely lurk? Do what they want to know more about their communities? So we're trying to establish mechanisms by which we can supply those values back, but during the process of them actually engaging themselves, we're also simultaneously telling them how their community is also being engaged. That's, I think, our two chunks. I'm really happy to follow you because um, one of the ways that we also measure success is by retaining engagement. And it's so difficult to do with, uh, with working class families that are working two or three jobs and then going home after work. Uh, to take care of their children. So we do a few things to make sure. First, the, the organization is intergenerational, which means no one ever ages out, uh, because we believe community is defined by having everybody at the table and that we learn across generations from each other. Um, we listen to body language. There's a lot of ways that people communicate without saying a word. Um, we provide child care, translation, and food. Uh, we meet when the community is accessible. Um, and we also, one of the ways that we have been able to get people involved over and over again is by having and documenting and celebrating short-term, mid-term, and long-term successes. Um, when people are involved in a campaign, whether it's to address a public health disparity or to gather data uh, uh, that shows that their condition is directly related to that condition, to that situation, uh, it's important that that they have some short-term successes because that's what keeps them coming back. It's something they can celebrate. It's something that comes out in the news. And then and then they stay in for the midterm, and then they stay in for the long term. Um, and so that, I think, is really important. People who are working really hard, who've got a lot of other stresses to deal with, uh, need to know that the time that they're committing uh, is actually manifesting in something positive that the community is benefiting from. And once they've seen that, they keep coming back. OK, I'm going to open it up to anybody, including the panelists, if they have questions. Yeah, th thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, following up on the sustainability question, um, I think we have some models out there, such as Framingham, Framingham Heart Study, the Nurses Health Study, where there has been real ownership mm -hmm. by all of the participants, which has required an awful lot of infrastructure of 
communication, et cetera. And I think those are successes maybe we can learn from. Um, but a question I have, and, I, and I, Elizabeth, I appreciate your comments on having short-term, mid-term, keeping people engaged. But so much of research is multiple years and incremental. There is no big, oh, wow. Um, in fact, it may be a negative wow, if that's a possibility. Um, but how do we not get citizen scientist fatigue or citizen fatigue when, you know, the outcome is, oh, this, you know, we didn't prove the null hypothesis, we got nowhere, on to the next study? I mean, it's hard to keep, you know, professional researchers engaged in those as well. So I think it's, or will only big OW research be appropriate for this? Can I, can I just give you a brief answer? I think, sure. I think the, the, pr the problem with how you're framing it is that you're thinking in terms of outcomes and we think in terms of process. So the process of bringing people together builds trust, builds relationships, uh, has people sharing information across the table, um, and those things are worth celebrating. Things change when you bring people together to work on a particular project, and, um, and there are successes, and those things have to be so if you think about the outcome, and this is a country that always thinks about what's at the end, but when you are, have a justice framework, we know that a lot of the change happens in the process. Those are the things that you have to lift. And um, you know, we have a, a group of cancer survivors, these women, who, ha who came to us because uh, they lost their bus and we got their bus back. And then they came back to us because they wanted to expand the median on 4th Avenue because there were 88 fatalities and deaths in five years. And we got the, the, the thing expanded. And now they're involved in uh, working with recovery folks. And they know that's going to take longer. But because they've gotten things along the way and we've been able to su you know, succeed, it's made it. But then we're also multi-issue, which makes it a little, a little easier for us also. I'd like to just follow up because I think it is a really important question. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, we need to be recognizing is that the, there's a sense of urgency amongst people who are living with illness that you just as researchers cannot appreciate and understand, and that we need to find ways of being able to build in incremental opportunities for learning. Uh, one of the things that we have learned over time is that patients are actually learning and benefiting just from the process itself, I think we've just heard, but also that we can have interim outcomes that actually help to benefit, whether it's a positive or negative one. The lithium study was a negative outcome, but yet people learned a lot as a result of that. Uh, we also learned a lot as a company about what that takes in, to engage patients and understand them and listen to them carefully. And then lastly, I would say, you know, sometimes, as I mentioned before, the research questions don't need to take so many years because the patient's kinds of questions may be different than the kinds of questions you're asking. So think about ways of reframing it so that we can maybe incrementally understand it better. I'll give you one example. Uh, we had one of our ALS patients who was scoring zero on the clinical endpoint for ALS, the functional rating score, so which meant she could no longer participate in clinical trial activities, um, said, I'm, I'm still functional. I'm assisted in every possible way with ventilators and every other kind of device, but I'm still a functional member of, of society. She actually worked with us, and we actually published with her um, the extension uh, items for extending the ALS FRS score so that you have three additional questions when you are using assistive devices. It did not take forever to get that done, but the positive impact of having that patient participate in that and have her be a co-author on that paper was incredibly valuable. Uh, can I just get people to raise their hands again, and then I'll see if I can keep track of you. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's start here and then go this way. Um, my question is about the process part of building trust and so on. Um, whether you're a patient and dealing with a for-profit medical uh, services system, or a community member who is exposed to toxins or who's denied services, uh, it, would it make a difference if the, if the trust building process is with, say, a for-profit company or with uh, a corporation that actually is funding the research that produces the pollution versus, so historically, there are interests in, of people in building trust in the authorities or researchers in building trust for purposes of controlling people and maybe even profiting, as well as interests of people who seek democracy and economic and social justice. And I'm wondering how you 
uh, pars, the trust issue, if trust could come uh, from both a motivation, either a motivation of benefit or uh, exploitation? Well, of course, in our present projects, we are not uh, directly channeling pharma trying to recruit patients, though indirectly we are, uh, ultimately. Uh, we're providing, trying to provide the environment such that there could be a trust relationship that a participant would recognize that entity as something they could contribute with, but it's an educational process. So right now, our trust relationships are, again, all led by advocates, all of uh, nonprofits, all which are patients, but predominantly, and all which are defining directly within their communities what they consider effective trust-based um, relationships. But, and then some of them, of course, have already, you know, given some serious thought to be more the for-profit or other, or other conditions, but we haven't actually, um, you know, made that a priority for developing the trust up front. The first part is just to go from the advocacy, go from the community, and then determine <coughs> disease uh, community by community, what their aspect, what their interests um, in some of those other relationships are. And some of our communities don't seem to have any direct interest in, in the for-profit relationships, though others, of course, might. So we're still testing it, but right now um, we're, we're trying to still lead from the uh, advocate, uh, uh, patient, participant as representative of trust first and letting that community self-develop such that it can be in a position to answer the questions of secondary, uh, you know, use or secondary engagement. So I think it's, it's different based on, on who you're talking about, whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit, and you can't always assume that the non-profit is always on the up and up either, right? Because that, that does happen. Um, we've got um, a business in our community that has reached out to every non-profit with funds so that they can support and bring their members into supporting a plan that would end up in their displacement. And our organization is, is literally feels like, you know, like we're fighting all of them. Um, so those are nonprofits, but they get resources and they provide services and they're, the community they serve will be displaced by this corporation coming in and doing this. Um, so, um, it, so the approach is different depending on who it is. We had a power plant company that wanted to expand its, its business and knew they couldn't get past us to expand and we put together a coalition uh, because they wanted to reach out to the community. We were sort of like the first stop. You couldn't reach out to them without us getting in the way. Uh, put together a community benefit agreement where they had to reduce net emissions. They could expand, but they had to use equipment that would reduce net emissions. Um, that had never been done before. It was a peaker uh, right next to our community that was dropping tons of knocks and socks on us. Um, we meet with businesses all the time to try to get them to engage in practices where they can continue their business because we're EJ, so we have to work somewhere, uh, but that they work in such a way that it's not killing our community. And so before they even get to the point where they, they need to, so we get funding so they can hire engineers so that we can look at their facility. But the trust thing doesn't come without the work being done. We can't trust unless we've had an engineer look at your plan. We can't trust unless we've gotten all of your information. Um, and then the trust happens. And we have been able to develop really good relationships with some businesses on the waterfront that have been open and willing to work with us in a way that's different. So we could support them and, and celebrate them as a business, and the community can feel confident that this particular business is operating in a way that's cleaner and better. But it takes, it takes a lot of different, a lot of different uh, efforts. like me. There we go. I'll just say quickly, I mean, we do have financial relationships with biopharmaceutical companies. And with us, it's all about transparency. It's in the consent we have on our homepage. We have how your data is being used. So we make it very transparent when and how we're sharing data. And we uh, periodically survey our membership about their perceptions of the privacy and confidentiality and data usage. And we make sure that when, we, when it's necessary, we alter our processes. So, you know, it's a rare disease community that's highly motivated. So I think I'll go back to this idea that it's very dependent on the community and what the community motivations are. 
as the one for-profit company sitting here at the table, I feel like I do need to respond. I think um, one of the uh, areas that we believe very firmly in is we would not have a, a site at all if we haven't established the trust of our patients to participate with us. So we take that very, very seriously. Uh, we have a, uh, an approach that really it, we, we adhere to, which is patients first. So we do engage with pharmaceutical companies because actually they have a lot of money to be able to start exploring questions that actually matter to patients, and especially patients who are looking for solutions to problems that, that we're not finding answers to. So, but we do that very intentionally and very carefully. And as I mentioned before, when we work with external researchers, whether it's an academic, clinical, nonprofit environment or a for-profit pharmaceutical company, we actually vet that project very carefully. It goes through an entire team and some of our patient advisors to determine, does this seem to matter to you? And are we putting patients first in this perspective? And then ultimately, if we can answer yes to those questions, then we continue to move on and move forward with it. We actually reject many uh, proposals that come our way because they are, are, are actually trying to answer questions of interest to the researcher and not necessarily to the to the community. So I think it's an important way. I think it, it, it does, you, you do need to parse that out some. Uh, we actually think of ourselves as not just for profit. And in many ways, we don't believe we could have built what we have today had we not had the investment uh, of people who really believed in what we were doing. So, you know, a nonprofit can only go so far. Um, I think we've been able to innovate more rapidly and to be able to grow more rapidly because of the investments that we've been able to generate. But without the trust of our patients, we would not be able to grow at all, regardless of how much money we had. I might just add something in here, which is I think that your question raises this issue of conflict of interest, which we've brought up before, because I think this is one place where the regulations kind of clash with um, sort of common sense and what we think we need to build relationships with trust, because the regulations really focus a lot on, for example, financial conflicts of interest, um, which you know, uh, might help with transparency in certain areas, but not in other areas where um, the issues are not primarily financial. So for example, if you're thinking about um, maybe a patient advocacy group that is recruiting um, it, its own members to be in a clinical trial and is also involved in the design of that clinical trial, there might be a conflict of interest there. Um, because if a pharmaceutical company were playing that same role, you would say, oh, no, you can't do that. That's, you know, you can't, you know, recruit and design the study and fund the study and do all that stuff. So um, I think the regulations and our thinking needs to kind of adjust to, well, what makes it okay and what makes it not okay? Um, is it oversight by a third party? Are there, what, you know, how do we negotiate that? Because it seems like you can't just sort of s have one set of rules and have it apply in both the financial context and the non-financial. Um, I know he had a hand up over here. Yeah, that was you, Pietro? And then in the back? OK. Um, so um, I, I found the question about, uh, can you hear me, the, uh, about relationship uh, success interesting. In particular, your answer, the spectrum of answers, um, was interesting in that it, um, um, it seemed to um, cover different interpretations of relationship success and who the stakeholder might be in that success. So in some cases, um, it seemed like success, a successful relationship was about the success of the individual. In other cases, it was more focused on the success of the community. And in some cases, it was literally the success of the relationship, the, you know, how long the relationship would endure. And so for me, that sort of raises um, the question of, um, whether or not there's some sense of obligation to study these relationships, to formally assess the impact of the relationships on the various stakeholders, um, and then and then uh, be transparent about that, so so folks could make informed choices. And I, so the first part of my question is: to what extent do you already do that sort of thing, and or and or believe that you should or shouldn't do that? And then the other part, I think, relates back to Leah's. Um, um, apt point, which is that for some people, if you give them enough rope, they'll hang themselves, right? So um, I think sometimes, uh, be, because I think, you know, everything you've described is, is, um, is motivated by positive intent, that um, we, we sort of tend to assume that, that this is going to be beneficial. Um, and, uh, and so the, are we obligated to determine circumstances and when it wouldn't be beneficial and also to report that? Where do we draw? the line of what we let people decide for themselves in a transparent environment versus what we would never ask them to do, even if they wanted to do it. 
So, is um, um, so to what extent do you believe that there's an obligation, um, maybe a moral, ethical obligation, to assess um, the impact of the relationship on the various stakeholders and then report that to all the potential stakeholders so they can make informed decisions versus just assuming that because the ultimate goal is a positive one that it's okay? Take a crack at it. I think uh, one of the things that we've done uh, early on, from our earliest days is to sort of uh, gauge what are the perceptions of the members of our communities. Um, what what do they perceive as benefits or maybe not benefits of participating in a, a site like Patients Like Me? Um, the interesting thing about it is that the uh, the results are generally always positive. Um, they're rarely negative, and I think when they are negative, some of it is partly because the community isn't well developed, and so it may be a little bit lonely yet. There might not be enough people there yet for them to feel uh, part of some of the same um, experiences that others have. But I think overall the perceptions of the benefits uh, of, of participating on the site actually lead us to better understand how we can then engage them better. So many of the uh, perceptions are the, the more connectedness people have, they perceive their outcomes are better. So the more people they're connecting with on the site, uh, those patients actually report improved outcomes. So it's like, okay, well then let's start thinking about how do we then identify how to engage pa patients a little differently. And I'm going to give you a little bit of um, data uh, science as well as um, the design science that we use. So one of the things that we, we did a few years ago was do something called persona-based design that comes out of the design world. And we, so we try to understand who are our users and then build some of our environment around who those people might be, whether they're people who are there to lurk in the forums and not ever participate, or they're there to track and monitor their disease, or they're some combination of the two. So, so we actually understand that a little bit better. And then the other is we have, um, you know, uh, uh, our engagement team and our community team who are constantly looking at the level of engagement people are having from the moment they come on all the way through and, how, and who drops off and who stays on. Our data science team then takes that same information and starts to create predictive modeling. So we actually now over seven years of time can now begin to think, uh, look at a person who joins the site today, understand some of the characteristics about them and predict whether they will be on the site three months from now. And then better understand how, what are the things things that keep them engaged. And some of it is just the connectedness. Some of it is helping them improve their outcomes. For some in epilepsy, it has to do with helping them better understand the side effects of their, um, their treatment so that they can better understand when they make a decision to go to the ER or not. There are a lot of different things that come into play, but that starts to build uh, a, a trust. It also builds the relationship. So I think um, studying that is actually really important. And so we, we continually try to evolve our user survey to kind of get a better sense. And we just haven't found a lot of negative as yet. So. Uh, okay. To, not to press the issue too much, but, um, uh, and, 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 you know, I, I, I think the world of patients like me, I actually use patients like me. I'm a patient like me. Um, <laughs> And, uh, uh, but it's conceivable to me that someone could, um, in a site like patients like me, um, have the perception of having a positive outcome, uh, yet relative to people who aren't engaged in the site, have a negative outcome. So um, uh, I, I believe my outcome was great, but actually my life expectancy was less than someone who wouldn't have joined the site. And, and so is, that's the... That's just an example, but to say, do we have an obligation to actually measure and study those things and report those risks to people to say, maybe even to say, we haven't studied this, and you might actually not be better off measured in these ways? I actually don't think about it in terms of studying it. I think in terms of evaluating, and that throughout the entire process, you're evaluating whether or not people are meaningfully engaged, whether you're meeting all of your outcomes and engaging people in the evaluation process constantly, um, having conversations with them and getting uh, your direction. You have to be adaptable and getting your direction from listening to people and having those conversations. So that evaluation uh, has to be an integral part of anything that we do.
So I think uh, from the perspective of NIH, the, these issues of the role of pharma in creating the infrastructure um, that allows for engagement and collects the data and makes the data usable is uh, really interesting to reflect about what kinds of questions can't get answered if that's the funding model. And I'm thinking in particular from my own perspective about environmental uh, factors in illness and prevention. There, there isn't really a comparable um, uh, industry like pharma that can fund prevention. And there, there's like, if you're preventing disease by avoiding environmental toxics, there's not a profit generating <laughs> opportunity in the same kind of way. So NIH needs to think about um, who can make the investment in the infrastructure to answer those questions. I guess the comment extends beyond pharma to yeah. the device and social uh, in, in industry out there that is the front line to, frankly, interacting with virtually everybody in this world and potentially our use of that data. Yeah, at some point, you know, we've got the Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks who are in the position to build partnerships um, for broad citizen science engagement, and there's no clear profit or model for that or obligation to them there, but um, they are there. And so I think even though pharma would be therapeutic based, uh, other partners are, um, I think, equally important. And uh, <clears throat> NIH would be great to have a policy that would extend to better understanding how we can develop those models and designs. I would also, I'd also add, I think it's a great comment, and um, I would also add, though, that in our experience over the last couple of years with pharma, for those that don't have a specific therapeutic molecule that they're studying, but they still want to get some patient insight into a variety of different things, um, they're actually starting to ask questions that are actually quite interesting uh, around quality of care and understanding what, what does empowerment mean, and starting to really try to get a better sense of what is it that motivates patients to do anything in particular around their health, which actually I think is a real shift in thinking. Uh, when we first started, most of the the pharma uh, money that was being thrown our way was from the marketing department, and we weren't all that interested in that. We wanted to talk with the epidemiologists and the scientists and really think about what start our data and start to answer questions about that really matter, not necessarily whether the packaging is right, although we did do a study on packaging and we informed them a lot about it. But really, the marketing piece of it wasn't as interesting to us as the research piece of it. So I think there's actually ways of being able to push that envelope a little bit by answering certain questions that matter to most people around the environment and finding ways of pushing the buttons of, of big companies like Google's and Facebook's and things like that, for which this matters, frankly, so. Thanks. Um, I want to maybe talk at a little higher level for a, a, a minute. So the, the title of the session is Building the Relationship, um, and I think what we've heard and probably what we knew coming in is that there are multiple relationships. Um, and, and the way that the structure of uh, how we think about research was about people who participated in research and people who carried it out. Uh, but it's quite different than that. And so I wonder if, to hear from you all, we could hear from you all about how you think about um, taking Kelly's direction to heart about generative work, what we need to, to know about that we don't already in terms of the relationships that are different in citizen science between those who participate, those who carry out research, whether they're researchers, whether they're private companies, pharmaceutical or PLM, um, or the institutions where people work. Uh, I work at Johns Hopkins, which has had a kind of checkered history, frankly, of doing uh, research involving communities. So how is this different than what we've been doing in the past, and what do we need to know from the perspective of generative ideas that we don't already as, as we go forward, we being the royal we here, NIH, us in the room, society, everybody. Well, just off the cuff, I think we need to know if it's worth it to maintain these. I mean, we need to determine if this sort of engagement can actually truly generate uh, outcomes and or at least moderately generate outcomes for the investment in the engagement that we're trying to address. Uh, we've seen it in small scales. 
but none of the citizen, very few of the citizen science projects we saw earlier are really, I mean, they generate research data, but are they generating, you know, positive benefit or economic benefit, I guess. So I don't know. What, do, do, what don't we know? Is it worth it yet? It might not be. I, I'm thinking, though, from an LC perspective, right, since that's why we're sitting in the room today, among the reasons. So the kinds of ethics, law, policy, social implications questions that um, ought to be thought about and pursued. And maybe you don't have a thought about that, but I, I want to try to keep us, to me, that's where the action ought to be. And, uh, you know, a lot of this, um, the general conversation is very interesting, too, but I, I want to sort of dig in and ask, is there anything different going on here in the context of this notion of relationship? So I'm going to echo something that was discussed previously, which is this idea of, of access. So, you know, we can, from our side, we can educate, which is really required, that idea of research imagination. But we are still, I'll speak for myself, but I suspect that applies to many people, we are still trying to engage a small subset of the patient caregiver population within our net. We're trying to engage a broad, we are engaging a small subset. So we still have really overriding issues of access to this whole process and um, representativeness in our engagement. And I think that those issues, while it's not a new issue, is a really compelling issue that is going to uh, have a major impact on how successful this whole enterprise is. So I sort of half answered your question, but I, I do think that this is something that is an area. So does it work? So does it generate new and ideas that are novel and important to communities? But when we say important to communities, are we talking about the top 5% of the community? Are we talking about the community? Can, I, I, I just want to add, we, we work with RAND and Lifelines, and we meet with them every Monday around 10 a.m. for about two hours. And I can say that um, maybe the recommendations and the things that we're saying just seem obvious, but they're not obviously being operationalized. That uh, maybe some of the input that we have may seem like, well, anybody can figure that out. But in fact, people are not doing these things. These relationships are not working in a lot of spaces, partly because of the conventional training that people have, because there's old school thinking about community. Um, and so, um, so it, it's my hope being here that people can get out of that space and think about these things differently. It takes a lot of work. If you're someone who has a particular discipline, your, uh, your discipline is to study, I don't know, um, by, epigenetics or something, and that's your thing, right? That's your passion. It's very difficult for you to get out of that space and start thinking, okay, I got to build these relationships. This is really important to collect the data so that we can get these outcomes. It's not the way that, that a lot of folks in this room have been trained, but it is a process that is going to contribute not only to a body of work, but to changing the landscape in a way that has to be changed. And so, um, so, so while some of it may not be I don't know, higher order thinking. Um, it is the kind of stuff that results in collecting data, um, getting policies changed as a result of data collection on the ground with our elected officials, um, to getting people in our community access to resources that they may not typically have if we hadn't been able to prove that there's a connection between these different things statistically. I just want to add something um, about sort of what's new in the LC part of what you know Elizabeth and, and Holly said, and I think it's just a it's a modification maybe of the old justice issues, and so we have been talking about who benefits from research, and we've moved towards you know oh now we study women, and now we have to study minorities, and we have to report we're that not, and be accountable. Minors. I know, but we're that's how the minors. NIH you know that's how it's that's how it's discussed. <laughs> But, but now we have to move that discussion into now what is, what, what is the just way of um, engaging communities at, at other levels, the other levels that we've been talking about, and, and perhaps maybe not just patients, because we have been sort of focused on patients, but I think there's a lot of other stakeholders and communities that might be considered in this citizen science space. And, um, so Sally, and then I know Effie had her hand up for a long time, and Jason, and then 
Okay. Just real quick, I think um, just to follow on that, I think the, uh, the the key piece here that NIH needs to really think about, and this is not news to them, is that we need to modernize the, the clinical trial and the research paradigm such that we are actually starting to address and get a sense of why people would want to participate in research today um, under the current governance and, and legal issues and ethical ways that they have to deal with all of the constraints of getting into a research um, and agenda. I think we need to, to really push that envelope because people are want to participate. It's just that the, the barriers to participation have been relatively high. And so I think modernizing it, understanding what's, what do we need to do to get to this action point does involve creating relationships with people to better understand what's keeping them from participating. But when we ask, would you participate if you were given the opportunity to do so, they say yes. Uh, they tell us why they haven't been participating, and a lot of times it's process and structure issues. So let's start to think about what those look like, and I think we'll start to break down some of the barriers. My question follows uh, closely to Jeff's, and one of the new things that we're hearing, and I think um, Sandra mentioned that earlier today, and I think Sally, you mentioned the work uh, democratization of, of, of research. And, and so I'm wondering if um, the way we're using democratization is clear to all of us, or we have criteria um, that need to be met in order to say, yes, we did democratize science or we did democratize research. Um, do you have a sense of what those criteria would be? Is it simply just involving more people? Is it simply uh, increasing numbers? Um, is democracy or democratization requires a different degree of engagement, um, more meaningful or more advanced or augmented or I don't know, know what. So I'd, I'd be interested in, in hearing your thoughts on that because I think this is one of the new things we're hearing com in comparison to, you know, our standard research that maybe wasn't democratized. So, um. Take a shot at it. I think, um, I think one of the things that uh, just the in information access has done, obviously, is given a democratization to everyone to have a better access to something that they might not have had access to before in terms of just knowledge about things. Now, um, when I say that, I think in the context of, um, of, of trials and research studies that are being done in a place like NIH, I think what we are offering is a heterogeneity that you just have never seen before, um, and that the homogenization of research actually has not really given us the kind of insights we need for people to live le as well as possible with the illnesses or conditions or situations or environments that they live with every day because we're not heterogeneous enough. So I think if there's one thing I think that democratization could start to provide us is access to people who would not typically have participated in something. And then st I do think, however, that there does need to be some structure and process around that, that it's not just a, you know, a free-for-all, although crowdsourcing and the other ways of doing, you know, cell slide, I love cell slide, I'll go on that, you know, identify cancer cells all the time. But I think the idea of doing what we are trying to do is not necessarily just, you know, corralling a lot of people and then suggesting that's going to answer all the questions. I think there does need to be some sort of science behind what that looks like, and hopefully we're starting in some of the th examples we've talked about to create some of that. But I think the environment is there, the milieu is there. Um, now we have to figure out uh, how to apply some of the traditional and yet contemporize them uh, approaches to thinking about how we get the best answers possible with a, a more heterogeneous um, population. So um, I think there's the there's this the the need for democratization and then there's the, the now um, right now for example the the the, uh, the Sina project has uh, it fundamentally recognizes that there's a very broad spectrum of how anyone defines their expectations for privacy their nuance that what they wish what they know wish some participate actively in everything give away their 23 me sequences others do not and there's and this moves this moves based on the social media this moves on based on family and influences moves on, on a thousand things so we're trying to we've established a mechanism by which that can be defined characterized that hopefully will allow anyone who wants to at least take the step of defining that that ability to define that and they can change that right now though we're only testing that in a limited number of actual much more focused less democratic, I guess, disease community is because that's where our funding is right now. But it, the goal is, again, to identify and evaluate that as a method for recognizing that we all have certain expectations for respect, for representation, for, for, for um, privacy, and we need to define that in some way, and they will change, and they will change, and we need to provide the mechanism for that to change, and then, of course, test that.
Hi, uh, it's a great panel. I'm having a lot of fun, and I'm trying to trying my hardest to get my thoughts together. But it really touches on uh, circles around a little bit. Many of the comments have, have already been made, uh, but part of it is sort of painting a scenario that we are in such early days of citizen science, and that we should anticipate in many ways that there are sort of infinite combinations of the ways a research study in its governance, its communication style, its presentation, its features could be set up. And that um, we've talked a little bit about sort of research literacy too, and that a lot of people are coming to this with very little to no, no research literacy. What is a good scientific question? Um, what are or what are high priority research goals and how do we design appropriate research studies to you know, achieve those goals. Um, and as people, hopefully, if, if, if this sort of movement is successful, we will go from sort of a rate of participation in research that is very low to one that is very high. And that participation in research is a cultural activity that's very much like people go to museums and concerts and uh, all sorts of the zoo, all sorts of things, um, and, uh, and and the same thing. People should consider sort of participating in research as one of those things. And as so, I guess the the point that I'm struggling with, and I wonder how much each of you, or if whether or not you've thought about this, is you can sort of imagine a future where um, there there on the one hand there are like a couple big platforms where they provide all of the possible combinations of features and governance and whatever so that they can be applicable to the most people possible, right? And then on the other hand, there are sort of small communities of practice who have sort of developed their own styles of research, right? That totally transparent, you can call into the IRB meeting, you know, data is shared with each research participant or not and all the different combinations. And, and so in that sense, since we're sort of so early on this, Everybody should anticipate failures of relationships, that whatever you are building for people may not be ultimately what they want, but they don't know what they want. And so how much are you planning in advance for failure and the ability of people to change their mind and take their data and donate it to some other research enterprise which actually meets their new expectations? Um, Maybe it's something that needs to get on the agenda, huh? Um, you, know, you know, I think um, uh, one of the things that I've learned, uh, I'm a clinician first of, and foremost, and I think one of the things I've learned from my uh, software engineer and, uh, and technology um, experts that I work with is that um, seeking perfection is probably uh, folly that we need to get to a point where we're, we're constantly iterating and learning and we're aligning ourselves against some measure that we're reaching for and then we're evaluating how we've done to get to that point. So I think, you know, while we've certainly had some failures, there's no doubt about that in terms of how we've developed the, the, uh, the, the taxonomy or the infrastructure within the company, um, each one of those has been an iterative learning experience to say, well, we're not going to do it that way again. Um, or, gosh, some part of that actually worked pretty well, but maybe we need to think about a different approach um, the next time we try to deploy something similar within the, within the technology. So, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question other than to say we don't we, we, we have a hard enough time sometimes um, just as a company celebrating our successes. You know, we're really hard on ourselves. So I think that um, we don't oftentimes uh, sort of think about ahead to say, okay, well, this could be a failure, so we better prepare for that. Um, I actually think that we have a more optimistic view and we go forward thinking we can accommodate and adapt as we find things that actually haven't worked. Um, but not necessarily call it a failure, but a learning opportunity. And I think that's actually sort of embedded in the continuous learning system, sort of really thinking about what did we learn from that, even though it didn't work as we expected it to work, there was something that we actually got out of that. So I don't know if that's the answer to your question, but I think um, we don't necessarily say, gosh, what will we do if this doesn't work? We're sort of thinking, how can we iterate this to the point where it's good enough for us to feel like we've got something really you know, satisfactory for what we were trying to accomplish? Yeah, I think even our responses tell you how complicated it is because we come from very different places. So you, you say citizen science is early, and I think that um, indigenous people and people of African ancestry have been doing it for a minute. 
uh, for hundreds of years. And so uh, we have our own ways of thinking about uh, citizen science. Um, and I think what's new is us coming together to try to figure it out together. And, and, and that's exciting. Um, but I, I, um, I think about, um, I, I agree that you have to adapt and that you can't have a cookie cutter approach. Um, that the approach is going to be different depending on whether you're in Indian country or whether you're in Brooklyn, New York, or whether you're, you know, for us, it's easy. We're very localized. We're in one particular community. We know that community. The organization's been there for 50 years. So we have deep roots. And so those relationships are much easier. Uh, but trying to come up with a, a framework that, um, that provides guidelines for the entire country is impossible. It has to be something that lives, that changes, depending on who you're approaching, what their motivation is, what their interests are, what the leadership looks like on the ground. And that, that flexibility has to be built in to the approach. The thing that should motivate you is this desire, I think, if, if, you know, if I can say that, um, to address something that needs to be addressed in a way that, that brings all these great thinkers together. We meet, I had mentioned we met with, with Rand and Lifelines. We learned an enormous amount from them. And they've learned an enormous amount from us. And they've changed their approach and how they communicate with our community. And we've changed our approach in terms of how we gather information and how we document it. It's been learning across the table. And it's, I think it's been a really positive experience. But it's unique to us. And it's unique to our community. I'm here, so I know you had your hand up for a really, really long time, and so you might have the last word. Did you have something to, Dave? I, I'll let you. I'll let you end it. So I'll go to you first, since, since you had your hand up for a long time. Okay, uh, Leah Shanley, and I uh, co-chair the Federal Community of Practice for Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science. So when I was a young grad student, I was sent up to work with the Menominee Nation uh, for three years on a project, and every single community member I met asked me three questions. Who are you? What are you getting out of it? And what are you giving back? And there was, we talk about conflict of interest. Corporations, you know, is first what we jumped to. But they perceived that I was going to be making a lot of money as an academic in publishing their knowledge, right? So we have to be very sensitive to that. Um, also, the time scales. I don't think, we talked a little bit about it, the 50 years. So I'm an academic. I'm thinking three years. Wow, I got a three-year grant. That's a long time. And the community is like, that's a drop in the bucket, right? You're going to be here and gone. What do we do after you leave? Um, also, the pace, the academic pace. We expect, you know, you've got to take exams, got to get your papers out. And the community needs to build trust and get to know you before they make decisions about what they want to share. So I think there's a disconnect between the academic and local communities. So I want to ask you, Elizabeth. We talked a lot about IRBs and, and institutional IRBs, but what about community? decision making about what research they invite in and what research they don't. So the tribe I worked with had a board of elders and leaders that made that decisions about who they wanted to invite and how did they make a sustainable relationship with these researchers. Our organization doesn't work on any issue that the community doesn't bring to our attention. So all of our campaigns, all of our initiatives grew out of a request from the community. So for example, when we built uh, the Climate Justice and, Resi and, and Community Resiliency Center, that was in response to the community saying that after Sandy, they wanted to know more than changing the light bulb. So we started a block-to-block -block organizing effort on adaptation and resilience. Um, so it's the same thing for the research. We basically have people come in and say, you know, we're really concerned. Uh, people went out um, during Sandy. Uh, they were engaged in recovery. We're just wondering. We have all these brownfields. Um, what does that mean? Did we breathe something? Did we touch something that was unhealthy? And, and what we do is we play this role of facilitator. We facilitate uh, community, meaningful community engagement, and we bring together partners that make it possible for them to get answers to their questions and use that information. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's how we do it. Uh, we train our young people to facilitate community meetings. Uh, we think that young people are not at risk, that they're at potential, and that they need to be engaged in a meaningful way early on in science. We start as young as third, fourth, and fifth grade, where our young people are learning how to organize, and they're learning about environmental justice. This. And so, um, so we have our elders working really closely with our young people. But a lot of times, the request, the demand is coming from our elders. 
Okay, I'm going to let you finish it out, um, Dave. Thanks, Mildred. I appreciate it. Um, first of all, great panel, great moderator. Thanks, guys. Um, um, and I won't hold us up on lunch uh, too long. Um, just maybe one thing that uh, you all could think about thinking about if, if it registers. I mean, I think about um, about four of the five of you, not so much you, Mildred. You're, the presentations you gave show that you're all sort of moderators and mediators between communities and, and research interests, uh, uh, corporate interests, d d you, you very much serve this mediating role. And I mean, I guess I'm sort of trying to get back to what, what Jeff was asking. I mean, I would ask you guys to think about whether uh, as in these mediating roles, are you helping to cut down or nip in the bud potential ethical, legal, and social issues? And and if so, is, is that something that you know, are obviously one size does not fit all, um, but but do we need to consider having in citizen science mediators, go-betweens, professional mediators of some sort, you know. And the flip side of that coin is as mediators, I think you guys can sit in tight positions, you know, uh, uh, where issues come up. And you also sit in positions of, of power and influence on both sides. And so uh, maybe something else to think about is, you know, as mediators, are not, you know, are there new ethical, legal, social issues that you all have to address or that, or that being mediators uh, uh, um, bring up? Um, so um, lunch goes from now until uh, 1.30. You've got 45 minutes. Uh, the only, and uh, the food upstairs is not bad. There's some med decent sushi like, all the way in the back of that place. Uh, and the only thing I would ask, um, um, as we go around and ask questions and speak, maybe we can just quickly say our names so that, uh, I mean, I think a lot of us know one another, but you know, by the end of the day, maybe we'll pretty much all know who each other is, uh, would be good. And I'm Dave Kaufman, uh, NHGRI, sorry. 